I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Remembering the victims of the deadly shooting in Arizona. It's important for us to pause for a moment and make sure that we're talking with each other in a way that, that heals, not in a way that wounds. And we go into the deep to look at Haiti one year after the devastating earthquake. The world cannot forget Haiti either. It's a small country in many ways uh, that needs outside assistance, but not outside dominance. Plus, making this the year of real relationships. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Terrible things happen for reasons that defy human understanding. Those words from President Obama last night, citing scripture as he memorialized the victims of last weekend's shooting in Arizona. There was more remembrance today, but there were also signs of hope as America tries to understand just what happened and why. God is within her. Words of healing, unity, and faith Wednesday night from President Barack Obama. At a time when we are far too eager to lay the blame for all that ails the world at the feet of those who happen to think differently than we do. It's important for us to pause for a moment and make sure that we're talking with each other in a way that, that heals, not in a way that wounds. The President also spoke words of hope about wounded Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. A few minutes after we left her room and some of her colleagues for, from Congress were in the room, Gabby opened her eyes for the first time. <laughs> Gabby opened her eyes for the first time. When that happened, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand was in the room, along with Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. All of a sudden, the, 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 slit, the slits of her eyes started to open. You could see the determination that she was struggling to get them open. We were telling Gabby how proud we were of her and how her courage is inspiring the nation and her strength. And to witness this unbelievable show of strength and determination was an unbelievable blessing. And then there is nine-year-old Christina Taylor Green. Christina was an A student. She was a dancer. She was a gymnast. She was a swimmer. She decided that she wanted to be the first woman to play in the major leagues. And as the only girl on her little league team, no one put it past her. Christina's funeral was today in Tucson. It was an event that was going to be met with protests by the Kansas-based Westboro Baptist Church. But after a groundswell of support for Green and the Arizona legislature passing an emergency bill to prohibit protesting within 300 feet of a funeral, the church backed down. <laughs> Catholic monks of the new Melloray Abbey handcrafted this casket in Dubuque, Iowa for the nine-year-old victim. Christina was born on September 11, 2001. Her funeral also featured a U.S. flag that flew on top of the World Trade Center. As for the alleged shooter, 22-year-old Jared Lee Loeffner, police are still trying to piece together his actions. Investigators, though, say they're focusing less on who was responsible and more on why the fatal shooting happened in the first place. That's one question Loeffner's ex-girlfriend says she would like to have answered as well. Oh my God, <laughs> that's all I could really say. And I just, after I heard the whole incident, I started thinking about, back about when we were dating the the weird conversations that we'd have that he would lose me in because he would go off on rants about government this, government that, blah, blah, blah. But for now, the families of the victims are trying to pick up the pieces and move on. That's something nine-year-old Christina Green's family says they're doing with God's help. We, we will, you know, get through this with our faith and our friends and our family. Another funeral will be held tomorrow in Tucson, this one for federal judge John Roll, who was also gunned down on Saturday. Earlier this week, Tucson Bishop Gerald Kakanis celebrated mass for the victims and their loved ones. Kakanis said God wants people to resist evil and act with civility and respect. Well, stay with us. When we come back, Haiti marks the first anniversary of a deadly earthquake. That story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, from Facebook to face to face, a new goal for 2011. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. 
A year after the deadly earthquake struck Haiti, the island nation still mourns and remembers. We get more from CNN's Ivan Watson in Haiti. A day of somber reflection for Haitians and the world. One year ago, the earth shook. It was a day that traumatized an entire society. In Port-au-Prince today, the faithful gathered, first at the remains of Notre Dame Cathedral, where they celebrated Catholic Mass, and in this stadium for a multi-denominational service. And later, a moment of silence. Like millions of others, Michel Clairville is still reeling from that terrible day. The earthquake destroyed his home, and several months later, his wife Eliane died of disease in a camp for the homeless. He still lives in one of these camps. The earthquake killed close to a quarter million people. In October, disaster struck again in the form of a deadly epidemic of cholera. The toll so far, more than 3,600 people dead. In November, Haitians went to the polls. Disputes over the presidential election turned violent and triggered a political crisis that's still simmering. Foreign governments pledged billions of dollars to help Haiti, but survivors like Michel Clairville say they haven't seen a penny of that help. Many people are suffering, he says, and we don't know why. For Michel Clairville and so many other Haitians, this has been a year of misery. Amid religious services and sad memorials, some frustrated Haitians decided to sound a note of protest. Hundreds of residents of tent cities marched through the streets of the capital singing and holding signs that said, if I don't speak up for myself now, I'll be condemned to live the rest of my life in a tent. That is CNN's Ivan Watson in Port-au-Prince. Well, meanwhile, Pope Benedict sent a message to Haiti on the first anniversary of the earthquake. The Pope assured Haitians of his prayers, particularly for the dead. He added that it's time to rebuild not just physical structures, but civil, social, and religious coexistence. Also on Wednesday, the Pope appointed a new archbishop for Haiti's capital of Port-au-Prince. Guy Poulard succeeds Archbishop Serge Mio, who died in the earthquake one year ago. Poulard was most recently Bishop of Lacai. On Wednesday, Pope Benedict also appointed a second auxiliary bishop for Port-au-Prince. In other news, following deadly attacks on Christians in Egypt, the relationship between that country and the Vatican hits a roadblock. We get details now from Rome Reports. Egypt has recalled their ambassador to the Vatican for consultation in light of the Pope's remarks on the need for the Egyptian government to do more to protect its Christian minority. Rome Reports was able to conduct an interview with the Egyptian ambassador to the Vatican before she was called back to Cairo. We do not share the views that uh, Christians are persecuted in our part of the world. Persecution is a big word. We do not, uh, in order to prove that there is persecution, you have to uh, be very careful. This is a legal term which could not be used casually. Um, in, this, um, in this sense, we do not share the views about uh, the uh, um, that our governments or some governments in the area have not provided protection for the uh, Christians in, in the Middle East. This comes two weeks after the New Year's Eve suicide bombing of a church which left 23 dead. It also resulted in several days of unrest as Christians clashed with police and Muslims in the street as they demanded government protection. Cops in Egypt are perceived as an integral part of the Egyptian uh, 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 the fabric of the Egyptian society. We do not like to perceive them and we do not perceive them as a, uh, as a minority. They have all the protection as any other Egyptian citizen in Egypt and uh, uh, their, their, their churches are protected, their, uh, themselves are protected in the streets like any other Egyptian uh, citizen. The Christian copes make up about 10% of the 80 million people in Egypt. According to the ambassador, these attacks are a form of terrorism against all citizens, not just Christians, and their government is actively working to find those responsible.
The government's reaction was, um, and still is, uh, that it, this is an attack, a terrorist attack against Egypt, the whole of Egypt, not only for uh, against Christians, but also against Muslims, against the Egyptian society in general and the Egyptian uh, uh, country in general. Egypt still maintains diplomatic relations with the Vatican, but considers the Pope's recent comments as an unacceptable interference in its internal affairs. In other news from Egypt, Christians took to the streets of Cairo last night to protest over the way they, they say they've been treated since the start of the year. The demonstrators uh, threw stones at police and blocked a major highway. Three officers, five riot police were injured. The demonstration came one day after an off-duty police officer shot and killed a 71-year-old Christian man and wounded five others. Christians in Egypt had been on edge since the New Year's Day suicide bombing of that Coptic church in Alexandria. Well, from the Vatican, an update on Pope John Paul's path to sainthood. Vatican officials have approved the miracle needed for the late pontiff's beatification. The miracle involves the healing of a French nun who had Parkinson's disease. A Vatican analyst says John Paul's beatification could take place as early as April 2nd, the sixth anniversary of his death. And back here in New York, a controversial video that was withdrawn from the Smithsonian last year is now on display at the Museum of Modern Art. The video, titled A Fire in My Belly, includes an image of ants crawling on a crucifix. Last year, the Catholic League called the video hate speech. Stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up. Just ahead, will Facebook, Twitter, and other social media take a back seat in 2011? We'll find out. Welcome back. Well, as you saw earlier on the show, last night Americans around the country gathered to share in a national moment of grief as President Barack Obama delivered his address at the memorial service for the victims of last week's tragic shooting in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, billed as a call for healing, he spoke about the need to live our lives in a manner that nurtures relationships with those who are still with us. Well, earlier I spoke with Matthew Warner, a regular contributor to the National Catholic Register, about nurturing relationships, real relationships that don't happen on Facebook walls or Twitter feeds, but face to face. Well, Matthew, thanks so much for joining us here today on Currents. We really appreciate your time. Sure thing. I'm happy to be here. Well, 2011, the year of real relationships, that uh, is what you encourage people to do. Make 2011 the year of real relationships in a, in a recent article. Explain to me what you mean by that. Sir, uh, well, I guess uh, we have a lot of things we call friends these days, and especially in kind of our Facebook culture, if you're, if you're involved online and social networking and all that kind of stuff, um, the definition of friend has kind of um, been watered down quite a bit. And um, so we make all these contacts and acquaintances and, and relationships, which are all good things in themselves, it can be. And, um, but, but in the mix of all that, I find myself kind of forgetting about really focusing on real friendships and, and the people that matter most to me. And um, it's tempting with so many things and so many opportunities out there to uh, let that priority kind of slip away. And so it was kind of just kind of an, an encouragement um, mostly for myself at first, but I know that a lot of people share the same kind of experience, and so I shared that in a recent post sure. um, on the National Catholic Register. Sure. Well, and, and this whole concept, is that kind of the point that it just sort of becomes friend overload, and I say friend in quotations? <laughs> I, I think that's right. I think, I think that because that's a good thing, and, I, and it's, it's, a, it's a good um, it's a natural human uh, thing that we want to have friendships and connections, and with the, the, the um, advancement of technology and social networking, we can have a lot of them. Um, and so the temptation is to have a lot of them, but for, to forget about the quality of those that we, that we have. And so it, it, and they, too, too often we, we end up getting distracted by the quantity and forgetting about the quality. Sure. Well, uh, take us through some of the steps here as to how we might go about doing this, about how you might go about making... 2011, more about real relationships instead of just those uh, sort of casual uh, uh, friend relationships online? Sure. I think for me, one of the things I had to do was to sort of cut back the, um, maybe even call it the opportunities for friendships. Because yeah. there's, there's so many out there, and, and it's all good things, like I said, but, but if we spread ourselves too thin trying to, to 
keep up so many different relationships, then none of them end up being very good because we can't really focus on ones enough. And what I found is that I end up sort of uh, shirking my responsibilities with my family and friends as well because I'm trying to maintain all of these other connections and and friendships and things like that. So for me, and this is one of the things I did, was I actually cut back um, a lot of my, my friends on Facebook because I had kind of used Facebook. I meet a lot of people and with blogging and you know, you get involved with different discussion groups and all these other great opportunities online, and you end up just becoming friends, quote-unquote friends with everybody that you meet. And um, what happened was I just had so many on there that I just, as far as a, a networking, a social networking and, and relationship aid that Facebook can be, um, it becomes ineffective because you're just not focusing on the ones that are most important. And so for me, I cut back a lot of those and really just tried to organize it to where um, – I was really, it was going to, it was going to force me to focus on the people that I care about most first. And then once those are taken care of, then go out and try to build those other relationships that are so wonderful. Um, so for me, that, that was one example using Facebook because that's a, a popular tool for keeping up with our friends and family and meeting new people and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Well, and, and another thing that you mentioned in the article is about, uh, you know, it, it's easy sometimes to focus on the low hanging fruit, so to speak, and those relationships that are easy. Um, you know, to, to sort of, you know, take care of and keep in touch and all of that. But then you encourage people instead to focus on the ones that are a little bit more difficult. Explain that. Sure. Well, I think, I think that when we come up against um, a tough relationship, and a lot of times it's with close friends or particularly our family, um, our extended family, and it's easy because there are so many opportunities to just make other friends we just kind of forget about those relationships and we let, instead of working on those because they're hard, we do the easy thing and go hang out with people that think just like us or are already easy to be friends with and fill our life with more friends and other things. And we forget about those ones that really are most important. And, and there's a number of reasons that's a sad thing because not only are they close relationships that we should be nurturing them, but they're often great opportunities that God are, God's giving us to, to really work on ourselves, to, um, probably look at examine ourselves a little bit that we would otherwise not do um, and to help and reach out to the people that God's put in our lives um, that we have a responsibility to maybe there's maybe there's something we can help them with and we, we kind of forget about that and just move on um, instead of really facing that and, and embracing that even if it is hard and often those are, that's what builds what you know the best friendships when we look at our best friendships and our best relationships in our families it's because we can look back and go wow we went through some tough times but we stuck it out, and it's, we put a lot into it. And the more you put into it, the more value that friendship has. There you go. Focus on the meaningful things in life. Well, Matthew Warner, blogger at Fallible Blogmat and also National Catholic Register, we only appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us. Sure thing. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Real relations. It's hard for me to delete anybody off of Facebook. I know that much. Stay with us. There's much more currents coming up. When we return a year after the earthquake, Brooklyn's bishop talks about Haiti. Haitians can determine their own future and what they think is important and necessary, but the world needs to assist them. Well, finally tonight, Haiti. The one-year anniversary of the earthquake there has put the hard-hit island nation back into the news and in the hearts and minds of people all around the world. But in many ways, the earthquake's impact wasn't only felt in Haiti. Haitians around the world were shaken to their very core when they learned of the latest tragedy to afflict their homeland. That experience was especially felt here in the Diocese of Brooklyn, which is home to thousands of people of Haitian descent. Not long after the quake, the diocese started a special program that allowed Haitian American priests to assist with the rebuilding effort there in their homeland. Joining them over the summer was none other than Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio. Now, one year after the earthquake, I had a chance to sit down and look back with Bishop DiMarzio as we went into the deep to talk about Haiti and its journey from rubble to reconstruction. Well, Bishop DiMarzio, thanks so much for being here again. We appreciate your time. Good to be here again. Well, uh, of course, we've just celebrated a somber uh, anniversary, the anniversary of the earthquake in, in Haiti one year ago uh, and, and a couple of days ago now. Um, your thoughts, because I, mean, I know that uh, you uh, made a trip there a few months back. What's the situation now looking at Haiti? 
Well, when I was there, they were still in the process of trying to clean up the debris, trying to come up with a plan for reconstruction. In the meantime, you know, we had the cholera epidemic, which is continuing. Uh, I think it's somewhat under control, but it's, it's a major new thing that they never had to deal with. They've never had cholera in, in Katy, believe it or not. Again, with the foreign workers coming in, the, the relief people and uh, UN, it seems, have come with them. It's a humanly mm -hmm. transmitted disease, and, and once it gets into the environment, people catch it. So, uh, you know, the old saying is it only rains on the people that are already wet, and I think that's what happened to Haiti. You know, they really just seems never to get a break. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, uh, the people that have a resiliency, I mean, I, that's what I, I know Haiti would have disappeared from the, the map a long time ago if the people were not resilient. Yeah. We're not uh, w willing to, to make s tremendous sacrifices in, in the country and even outside the country. Uh, Haiti survives on remittances, people sending money back to their relatives, people sacrificing here, doing a little less so their relatives can live uh, you know, sometimes in a bare existence, but at least they are living. They, they get this money that helps them buy the, the essentials of life, food and other things that are very sure. necessary. So that's, that's Haiti's story. Um, hopefully, with the new election yet to be decided, we'll have some new leadership and a plan of reconstruction can be put into place that will really start to turn the country around. Yeah. And, and we need to get an economic development there, obviously. That's not going to really turn around until we have that. But that's a long-range plan. And I see some s positive signs in that regard, but it's a long road for Haiti. Right, right, absolutely. And uh, of course, you did. You mentioned people here, you know, sending money back to their relatives in Haiti. There are a lot of Haitians here, a very large population in uh, the Brooklyn diocese. Right. Uh, and you, I know, recently uh, uh, celebrated mass uh, honoring the anniversary of uh, the uh, of, of Haiti's independence, anyway. Yes. And then also the, I believe, earlier this week, the uh, anniversary of of the earthquake. Right. What do you say um, to people, and, and, and what, what sense do you get of the Haitians who are here in Brooklyn and Queens about what they're going through being so far away? Again, it's, it's that separation, and this happens with all immigrants. You know, they're, they're not that far from the homeland today because the cell phones and they're able to communicate. Uh, the land phones in Haiti are scarce, but this, everybody's got cell phones, and that, that helps things move along. Uh, and keep communication going. They don't feel isolated in that sense. They wish they could get there. It's not always easy. But uh, there is this solidarity, clearly, that happens and has happened between the people of Haiti and the uh, people here in the United States and the larger community. I, w I was able to announce on uh, the anniversary mass that w we gave $1.3 million from the Diocese of Brooklyn to the reconstruction effort some of which went to Catholic Relief Services, other part of it would go to the reconstruction of churches and religious institutions. So uh, we've done a lot, not just the Haitian community, but everyone has contributed and, and made, a, made a difference. So uh, it, it's to show that people are not uh, isolated, not forgotten. That means so much to people. Mm. Uh, when I was there, I would visit at one of the camps where our priests were working. We had our mission there. and. Uh, to, to this day, we're getting thank yous from the people saying, oh, thank God the bishop came and made us feel that we weren't forgotten. And that's really important to people. You know, they yeah. can put up a lot of things if you don't feel like uh, you're forgotten. Uh, you, you, you do a lot of things that are difficult. Yeah. If so, you feel somebody's on the side, at least cheering for you, rooting that you, that you accomplish it. Absolutely. Well, looking forward, what more needs to be done uh, in, in Haiti? As you said, it's a long, long yeah. road ahead. But uh, what can the world community do to try and help well, make it better? The world community has come together and pledged a certain aid. Now, it has yet to be delivered because the, the reconstruction plan, which has to be done by the government itself, it can't be taken over by outside forces, they've got to do it, hasn't been able to do it yet. So once you get a government, once they can get a plan that they agree on, to reconstruct the Port au Prince, basically, which is the most damaged in a city that's really leveled, they've got to start all over again. So. It means that, that the world cannot forget Haiti either. It's a, it's a, it's a country, a small country in, in many ways, uh, that needs outside assistance, but not outside dominance. So that, that's the balance we've got to strike, that Haitians can determine their own future, and what they think is important and necessary, but the world needs to assist them. Sure. All right. Well, Bishop DiMarzio, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it.
Well, that is it for tonight. Now coming up tomorrow, more on Haiti as we check in one year later and how the island nation is doing now through the eyes of a couple of Brooklyn priests. Plus, we'll travel around New York and take you to a memorial at St. Patrick's Cathedral and one even closer to home in the heart of Brooklyn's, of one of Brooklyn's Haitian communities. You won't want to miss that. But until then, be sure to check us out online. We're over at CurrentsNY.net on the World Wide Web. We're also over on Twitter and Facebook as well. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.